to go ahead and start since everyone's here. Um, welcome to the career um, panel portion of our virtual student summit. Um, my name is Samara Zuckerbrod. I am a sustainability studies and English major from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also the external relations director of UT Austin's Campus Environmental Center. Um, right now we have five um, presenters from different fields um, within the sustainability industry who are gonna give you advice um, um, about entering the sustainability workforce and provide you with a little bit of their experience in their different industries. Um, the five different fields we selected are conservation advocacy, environmental justice, um, energy, environmental communication, and sustainable student engagement. Um, once again, thank you all for joining us and um, thank you for the candidates for coming to speak with us. Um, Darcy is also gonna help me moderate this career panel. Um, you all just um, heard from her for the uh, sustainability advocacy workshop, but I'm gonna let Darcy reintroduce themselves. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today. We are super excited to share this career panel with you. Um, like Samara said, my name is Darcy Hansen. I go to Southwestern University. I'm a senior and I'm a uh, intern at the Office of Sustainability. So first I would like to introduce Veronica Johnson um, in her role at Southwestern. Um, Darcy, I'm just gonna give a little bit more of an overview. Oh, I'm sorry. So sorry. Go ahead. I got excited. Um, so go we're ahead. gonna individually, we're gonna individually introduce each candidate and then um, um, please, will you each give after each individual introduction a little bit more of an in-depth overview, taking about three minutes or so to uh, detail how you got involved with sustainability and your career thus far. Um, and then we're going to move on to our general questions for the panelists. Um, at the end, there will be about 20 minutes for student questions. So students, if you have panel or questions during the panel, I encourage you to write them down or send them to Darcy and I. Um, or you can bring them up at the end yourself. Hi again. Um, so I would like to reintroduce Veronica Johnson um, in her role at Southwestern University as their uh, sustainability coordinator. Veronica provides support for student-led sustainability projects, hosts the Georgetown Green Film Series, and implements environmentally friendly infrastructure and initiatives on campus. Veronica also serves as the co-chair for the campus's sustainability committee and as the communications co-chair on the Texas Regional Alliance for Campus Sustainability's executive committee. She earned an MBA in sustainability from Bard College in 2021 and a BA in environmental engineering from Rice University at 2016. Thank you so much for being here with us, Veronica. So do you want me to do the three minutes now or do we want to go through each person and then circle Yeah, back? I was going to let each person do it okay. right after they're introduced. Okay, woo, on the spot. Uh, well, thank you, Darcy, for that amazing introduction. You pretty much covered everything that I do at Southwestern University. I am Southwestern's first ever sustainability coordinator. It's a relatively new position that was created about three years ago, uh, and I'm the first person to hop into that role. Uh, a little bit of background of myself, of how I came to be in this position, is I graduated from Rice with an engineering degree and realized relatively quickly I had no interest in being an engineer. Um, are doing anything with that degree. Uh, so naturally, I joined the Peace Corps. Uh, I served as an environmental educator very briefly in Nicaragua. Um, however, my service was cut short due to uh, medical issues. And then coming back here, um, I realized I wanted to get more into sustainability in higher education as opposed to just general education. Um, and through that, I realized I needed to do my um, master's program in which I did my MBA in sustainability. Um, and then through that, um, started applying for jobs and there, the timing was right. And Southwestern was looking for an entry level position and I was ready to start uh, doing my career as a sustainability professional in higher education. Awesome, thank you so much, Veronica. Um, next up is Celine Rendon. Uh, Celine Rendon is the Texas Project Specialist for EcoRise, which is an Austin-based organization that designs school-based programs centered around empowering youth to tackle um, real-world sustainability challenges. She has a bachelor's 
in science, uh, bachelor's in science in environmental science and geography, as well as a certificate in public policy from UT Austin. Prior to joining EcoRise, she served as the community engagement specialist for Austin's Office of Sustainability and supported the development of Austin's uh, 2021 Climate Equity Plan. Um, in college, Celine uh, co-founded and led the Environmental Justice Collective, uh, which we heard speak earlier today at UT. Um, and um, that's part of the Campus Environmental Center where I work. Um, thanks so much for being with us, Celine. Uh, do you wanna share a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Amara. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here with all of y'all today and looking forward to getting into discussion. Um, so when I was at the University of Texas of Austin, like Tamara mentioned, I was studying environmental science. Um, I've always had a passion on social justice issues. Um, you know, when I was in high school, um, growing up and I always knew I wanted to be in STEM and environmental science is kind of where I, I ended up. But uh, when I saw a internship posting by people organized in defense of earth and our resources, uh, well, that is a, it's a EJ uh, East Austin group. Um, I, I joined because they were working on community health action related to um, land use affordability and housing. And since that, honestly, I, that kind of took off of like where my major passions were in school around climate equity um, and uh, background envir of environmental justice issues. But when I was at school, I didn't really see that present at all at the campus with the curriculum that was being taught. So as Samara mentioned, that kind of led the way of a lot of work I did for student organizing on camp, students organizing on campus um, for the Environmental Justice Collective. Um, to address that, uh, the gaps in environmental science that doesn't uh, address the history of racism and land use planning. Um, and yeah, I ended up being a community engagement specialist in the city of Austin. Um, in between that, the different internships, different um, organi organizing work that I was doing on the side. So I, I think all of that has led to where I'm at now in the K through 12 environmental education space. Great, thank you. Awesome, so I would like to introduce Dr. Carrie W. King. Um, Dr. King is a research, assist, research scientist, excuse me, at the University of Texas at Austin and assistant director at the Energy Institute. He has both a BS and a PhD in mechanical engineering from UT Austin. Dr. King performs interdisciplinary research related to how energy systems interact with the economy and environment, as well as how our policy and social systems can make decisions and trade-offs among these competing factors. The past performance of our energy systems is no guarantee of future returns, yet we must understand the development of past energy systems. Dr. King's research goals center on rigorous interpretations of the past to determine the most probable future energy pathways. Dr. King is also the author of the book, The Economic Superorganism Beyond the Competing Narratives of, on Energy, Growth, and Policy. Thank you so much for being with us here, Dr. King. If you would like to share a little bit about yourself, we would love to learn more. All right, thank you. So that's, since you mentioned my book, um, if you're at a major university, you might have access to the book for free through your library system and it's published by Springer. So if you look up Springer link, like L-I-N-K, then you might be able to find it for free or you can buy it for 20 or $30, depending on digital or hard copy. But, um, yeah, as, as stated, my background is mechanical engineering, and through my education, I was a fairly typical, pure engineer type, uh, did purely engineering type research on my dissertation. But then when I got out, uh, I got back into academics a few years later, and my interests were more in the broad energy system, and I'd done uh, research related to life cycle assessment, like understanding the energy and water nexus, as they say, or the linkages between energy and water systems, which we kind of learned a little bit more about during the freeze in February here in Texas. Um, but lately, my work has been a, a lot more related to understanding the macro economy, which is to say uh, metrics like gross domestic product, total energy consumption, uh, 
wage wages like total wages and how how much of GDP goes to wages versus capital and these have uh, implications for understanding at least high level broadly uh, inequality or wage inequality and the, the more I've studied these things over the past decade and expressed some of these ideas in my book uh, the more I come to understand that physical having a physical understanding of the world and having understanding of physical principles ranging from ideas in physics and biology and engineering uh, really can help you understand social outcomes. And this is not, I think, I think not widely enough appreciated uh, nor recognized, but this is a, I think this is kind of the challenge to understand this and to link physical modeling to, let's just say economic modeling, which is what I do. Because um, just to give you an example for the, the most commonly used model uh, sort of framework for economic growth essentially doesn't consider the fundamental role of energy as an input, but uh, at a practical level, we all know that every machine needs energy to operate. It's a building or a car or a power plant. You have to consume energy to operate it. If this fundamental idea as a physical principle is not well integrated into economic thinking, and I think this leads to a lot of social outcomes that don't turn out the way people want them to or environmental outcomes that don't turn out the way people want them to because they're sort of neglecting this principle. Um, and you can even think about things like evolution and what the pressures of the economy are. And if the pressures on the economy are similar to the pressures of evolution and natural selection. So in some sense, that's why the book is called the economic superorganism because it, the economy operates in a similar way as uh, biological organisms and ecosystems. And if you think about it that way, then you can perhaps understand why it's hard for why the economy seems not to change, for example, moving towards uh, greenhouse gas mitigation as fast as uh, the policies indicate that there is desire to do. So if the, the desire seems to be there in terms of signing documents, then why doesn't it actually physically happen? So that's just my introductory thought. So thanks, I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you. Um, Professor Salinas Davis is next. Um, um, Valerie Salinas Davis is a lecturer for UT Austin School of Advertising and PR, where she teaches a course on environmental communications. Um, she has a bachelor's in journalism and public relations from UT Austin. And in 1997, uh, she founded EnviroMedia, an environmental marketing agency, which operated for 20 years. Um, her agency helped start America Recycles Day, led the Don't Mess with Texas Little Prevention campaign, and consulted with top companies like HEB. Um, she is also the co-founder of the nonprofit Wasteless Wednesday, which you can talk more about. In her free time, she is synthesizing her decades of environmental communications experience into a book. Uh, thanks for being here. Do you want to say a little bit more about yourself? Thanks, Samara, and thank you for the invitation to, to speak today. And it, it's great to um, be on this panel uh, with experts in sustainability. Um, yeah, thanks for that introduction. I did not go, you know, grow up wanting to do things to pr protect the environment or even to go into communications, but that has been my niche for decades. So um, after graduating from UT, I got a bachelor, as Samara said, bachelor of journalism and PR. And my first job out of college was to work at UT on campus at the UT Alumni Association working on the alumni magazine. So back in the 80s and early 90s, we did a lot of writing covering technical stuff, engineering, science. And so that really uh, got my attention. There's a right way and a wrong way to communicate about the technical stuff. And then my next job, uh, I uh, went to work on the client side of uh, don't mess with Texas. So I worked for uh, the Texas Department of Transportation and gsd &M was the agency. They created Don't Mess with Texas. So that was my first real foray into environmental communication. And there, you know, that, that campaign is still considered, you know, historic. It's still active, very active. But they, um, gsd &M and TxDOT applied real marketing techniques to an environmental um, public service campaign. So it was edgy and fun and featured celebrities. And so that's where I learned 
uh, that there is a cliche, there is a cliche way to do environmental communication and a fun, savvy, original way to do it. Then I went on to work for the Texas Campaign for the Environment, uh, um, working again with an outside agency on a program called Clean Texas 2000. So uh, air, water, and waste issues. My job was to do legislatively mandated environmental communications to Texans, work with uh, in municipalities and uh, big heavy industry too. So after three years of that, um, realizing that it's very easy to screw up environmental communications, you need to know how to work with the engineers, the scientists, but also it's easy to stub your toe politically. So you need to uh, make sure that you have all your stakeholders engaged properly. And then that cliche thing, there's a way to do it in a way that hasn't been done rather than turning your logo green and putting a, a leaf on it. So quit my job uh, and co-founded the agency EnviroMedia and ran that for 22 years. One of the high points, Corey, fellow panel panelist was working with being a bridge between TCE and Dell with the big electronics recycling issue more than 10 years ago. And so started teaching at, at UT as a lecturer after closing EnviroMedia and uh, um, in uh, late 2020 and in spring 2021 was my first environmental communications class now in my third semester. And, um, and Samara was in that, that very first class. So it's great to still be working together. Thank you. Awesome. And I would like to introduce Corey Triani. If I said your last name wrong, please correct me. I apologize. Um, but Corey is the Senior Campaign Strategy Director at Texas Campaign for the Environment, TCE, a statewide advocacy organization. Corey started his environmental career in 2011, organizing fighting hydraulic fracturing in neighborhoods in Denton, Texas. In 2012, he co-founded a direct action campaign with activists and landowners to oppose the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline in East Texas. For the past nine years with TCE, Corey has worked to organize support for local, state, federal, and corporate policies on zero waste, energy, and climate issues. Corey has expertise in meeting facilitation, campaign strategy development, lobbying, and communications. He is interested in bridging relationships with individuals and groups within and outside the environmental movement and finding shared struggles with working class, labor, and social justice movements. Thank you so much for being here with us, Corey. Would you like to say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And yeah, my name is Corey Traiani. Um, nice to be here with you all. Um, I'm excited for this chat, um, and I guess I'm honored to go last and get to hear what other panelists' backgrounds are, and I'm, I'm really excited to be in this space with you all and talking with students and faculty um, about um, what, it, what it looks like to work in different areas of sustainability. So um, my, my career in this work started um, when I was a student doing student organizing, um, similar to you, Celine. Um, and uh, at that time, I was living in Denton and I was attending the University of North Texas, um, one of the first cities where hydraulic fracturing or fracking um, started to appear in an urban environment in the United States. Um, it was in the, in, the, in the early 2000s. And then uh, when I was in, in school there, um, right around 2010, 2011, that this started happening um, in neighborhoods. Um, this advanced drilling technology that like seemed really appealing on television, that it was gonna unlock, you know, energy independence for America, but what really turned out to be a highly toxic process and exposed a lot of people to some serious environmental risks, um, not to mention risks to their property. And, and uh, uh, we put up a fight against it. Um, both as students and as members of the community. And it was the first time that I got exposed to doing um, organizing work, community organizing work. Um, started showing up to council meetings on a weekly basis and really kind of fell in love with the work and, and realized how environmental issues can really hit you close to home, um, especially in our state where, you know, we consider ourselves to be an energy capital of the world um, and where that energy comes from. 
uh, can have an enormous impact on our public health and our livelihoods. And there is a real debate that's going on over public opinion on what the future of our state and what the future of our world is going to look like. Um, and I think that we can win that debate despite having been completely outnumbered in the order of billions of dollars by these oil and gas companies um, by organizing people and by appealing to people's interests. Um, I know that we have you know, communication experts here with us. Um, I think that it is, uh, it is um, we're definitely outspent all of the time on these campaigns, but we can really um, change people's hearts and minds by appealing, um, appealing to people in ways that hit home for them um, and uh, by using strategies that are edgier and um, outcompete with massive corporations that are trying to extract as much capital as they can from our planet. So I, I'd love to you know, talk uh, about my organizing history with y'all here, um, talk about what it looks like to work in coalitions and, um, and also just kind of generally what it looks like getting in the field of the environment these days, which I think has like changed so much in the last like several years. So yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks. Great. Thank you all for giving such a thorough background of how you got interested in sustainability. It's so cool that everyone approaches it for different reasons and at different points in their life. Um, I think you all gave a really great overview of why you decided to go into the field of sustainability. So I'm going to skip that first question um, and get a um, ask you to respond in any order you'd like. Um, how do you think what you learned in the classroom and skills you gained through your college experiences have translated into the work you do um, today? Um, do you think it was more, do you think that was very helpful or do you think you've learned more on the job? Uh, this is Carrie. Maybe I'll, I'll start mine maybe easier. So when I studied uh, in engineering, I studied what we would call dynamic systems and controls, which is to say, uh, make equations that describe how things move around, uh, not in a quantum mechanics physics sense, but just cars and trains and planes and these kinds of things. So that translates pretty well to, to making equations that explain to how the economy, how money moves around the economy or something like that. So that's and I, since I still do research then, what I learned is undergraduate and a PhD is still translates. But what I didn't do as much when I went to undergraduate school is I placed out of English classes and I wouldn't consider myself a great writer. Uh, so I didn't actually enhance my writing skills or pure communication. There was minimal communication training, if you will, in engineering. Uh, but then when, in writing my book, I probably uh, spent three and a half years and um, and I write journal articles and thing, and that helps as well. But the book was good. Um, I probably, I don't know if I'm a 10 times better writer, but anyway, five or six times better writer uh, just by forcing myself to do it. And when I read the book again, I'm actually pleased at how things sound and I can read the last chapters and I can see that they're actually better than the first chapters. So uh, just putting things into practice. So I learned on the job on that one. So it's a combination of everything. I'll stop there. Awesome, thank you. Any Anyone else wanna answer that question? Yeah, I, I'm happy to chime in. I, I would say my experience is also the same, a little bit of both on the job versus learning in the classroom. Uh, as an undergrad, I would say the most useful skill that I learned uh, was the ability to, to conduct benchmark research. Um, I did that in both a class as well as in my internship. Um, and benchmarking just gives you the opportunity to evaluate yourself with your peers, see how you compare, and most importantly, learn from those who are already doing something well, as opposed to trying to recreate or reinvent the will. Um, I'll also say, not in my undergraduate program, but in my graduate program, um, I learned a lot um, just having an MBA background. So regardless if you are a sustainability professional in government, education, or corporation, if you want to be a change leader, you have to be able to make the business case uh, for whatever it is you're trying to get across. Um, so being able to articulate the financial returns, articulating the social benefits, um, basically learning the, the lingo of the C-suite or the higher ups um, is really advantageous to 
being able to implement a sustainability project. Valerie, I don't know if you wanted to go. Uh, sure. mine, mine will be fast. I, I would be willing to bet I'm the elder in the group. I graduated, I just did the math 37 years ago. There were, I'm doing this on a, zooming on a MacBook Pro in my journalism labs. We were typing uh, press releases on electric typewriters. Uh, I don't even, uh, no, with the recycling rate, we certainly didn't have curbside recycling back in that day. So in school for me, it was all about journalism and PR. And so you heard my story about how I sort of it just evolved into the environmental side of um, communication. So I will finish that by saying one reason my company became valuable to corporations like um, uh, Dell and other tech companies, uh, whether it's energy efficiency or electronics recycling or other large corporations that we ended up working for. If we found that a lot of times this idea of having a sustainability job within, especially within a large corporation and uh, uh, was it was really non-existent so my company would come in handy uh, for it seemed like sustainability would either fall into the laps of someone mid-career in in communication in communication or an engineer and so there were no sustainability teams and so we became talking partners and all that's changing and i'm so thrilled to not just be able to teach environmental communication, but be a part of this forum with sustainability students all over uh, the state. So uh, it's changing and it's a big, important, much needed um, career path. Um, awesome. So I definitely um, experiences both in and out of school go hand in hand. Um, I remember a trusted mentor of mine, his name's Dave Cortez, he's an organizer of Sierra Club, but having this discussion about it's so important that you root your learning and research in community and what's happening around you and making sure when you're a student that you're applying that, um, you know, to real world experience. So definitely I, I'm grateful that you know, I, I took the time to do that. It wasn't easy. I think um, a lot of the times internships or even unpaid internships, it's a, it's a, a luxury to have. Um, I remember like having to work at on campus at Starbucks, having to work at the pizza press on six uh, on West Sixth Street. Like I didn't have sustainability or environmental uh, internships at the early on because they were often unpaid. And um, it wasn't until like, yeah, my junior, senior year that I get to have that real world experience with within my major. But, you know, I still think all of that experience, talking to people, having that, you know, working job still contributed to, you know, things that I learned. Um, and yeah, I, I think too, you understand studying environmental science and when you're applying that to like work that you're doing outside of school, you definitely, um, that's when I started noticing like, why don't we talk about this in my environmental science class? Or why are there so few people of color from the US, not international students from the US um, in my classes? Um, why is it so few? And I felt feel like being curious, you know, both inside the classroom and outside with things that I was learning and engaging with people really was um, so crucial for my education. Um, I still consider Susana Almanza from Poder uh, my mentor, um, people that have looked out for me when I was an undergrad uh, with the topics I was learning about and the organizing work that we were going into. And it's, it's not easy, but you know, learning from them was such a crucial part of my education um, and still what I reference to this day 
in the environmental justice, climate planning, policy field, um, fundamental to that environmental education background. But definitely go hand in hand because we were doing research, we were doing presentations, like we're doing, you know, the science and we're doing the, the community engagement component. So, um, yeah, I appreciated both of those parts of all of it. Yeah, Selena, I think that like what you just said, I, it resonates with me a lot, like finding ways in which um, you can conceive of the work that you want to get into, it, it needs to be, I think, rooted in in something that's that's happening in the real world. I mean, I, I guess I'm coming from a place where I don't come to this space with a lot of academic background. I have an undergrad. Um, and I really, really appreciate all of everything that I got out of my college experience. It was totally invaluable and helped shape me as the person that I am today. I think in addition to that college experience, what was happening in those classrooms on campus, just as important was the work that I was engaged in outside of that, which was like identifying student organizations that like resonated with like my politics and what I wanted to get involved with. And those groups were working embedded with other community organizations in the community that um, I was living in. And I think that all of that is really important, especially, I mean, I will speak from like my my section of the world, which is in advocacy spaces and in working to influence politicians and working to change like uh, the state of things um, from kind of an agitating perspective. Um, and it's, it's really important to have um, community roots in that. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I'll, I'll also speak that like I, right now my organization is gonna be opening up several positions and um, the things that we're gonna be looking for are definitely gonna be folks who have some background and know how to write a paper and know how to communicate articulately. And those, those are skills and those are fundamental things that you learn from, from your college experience. Um, it's the first time that I was exposed to like logic was in like an introduction to logic class in college. Um, but in addition to that, I'm going to be specifically looking for people who have work doing community organizing, um, people, folks that have, you know, one or two years of experience, like doing the real work in addition to being in the academic environment. I don't think that, um, and I, I think that this is probably true of a lot of employers is that like, people are looking for folks who have experience doing the type of work that they want to bring you in to do. And it's not all from the academic world that you get that. So. I think it's really cool to start to see professors are starting to do that to engage in in some of like some hands on work and into playing their students in that direction, um, rather than having stuff be like kind of siloed in, in academia. So um, I would look out for those professors and start to have relationships with them. Um, you know, talk to your professors um, outside of class. That's like probably one of the biggest things that I probably would have uh, redone in college. Um, and, and try to get some of that, more of that hands-on experience that you can um, throughout college if possible. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so our next question is, how would you approach the job search process if you were to enter your field today? I can break the silence. Uh, I have two, two quick pieces of advice. The first is the network. So in particular, schedule coffee chats or Zoom chats with people who are in careers that you're interested in. Um, find out what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and find out how they got there. Um, the second is just to read job descriptions and look at, through the qualifications that the job poster is looking for and then start figuring out ways to work towards addressing any gaps you may have. Is it a degree that you're missing? Is it a certain number of years experience? Is it a, a hands-on skill that you can easily like learn through YouTube tutorials? Um, just trying to bump up your resume to make you a more competitive candidate. I'll say something, this is Carrie, and the, I guess with regard to maybe just the field of energy, I guess it could hold for more, more environmentally structured jobs, but you know, I only teach one class and it's kind of like you know, intro to energy or intro to sort of energy and the economy and how it all fits together. And I've had several of the students say they got 
they had you know, interviews for jobs or internships, and they thought because of the class it helped them get the internship or the job. And I, I think what they mean is basically, you know, I go over lots of data, I show lots of charts, and then they get mad and it's boring because there's charts. But to me, it's like, well, if you if you're wanting to understand the energy system, then there's a core set of data and understanding how to interpret those data then gives you the basis to form your own opinions or your own views. Um, because a lot of the times people aren't disagreeing about the data. <laughs> They're just disagreeing about which data to emphasize and uh, which point they think is more important. And I think I think the employers, the people in, in interviewing them could get a sense that, oh, well, they, they seem to have an understanding of some, some of the real basic data and concepts here. And so, yeah, you know, they, you learn individual things on the job, but it would show a level of interest that you sort of know some of the basic terminology and uh, it's not even complicated. I, I don't really use, you know, there's not really a lot of math in my class. It's just understanding historical trends and the concept of how we got to today through industrialization. And I think, I think employers seem to just appreciate that the students coming out of undergraduate will have that just general perspective. Selena, someone who kind of just entered the workforce um, relative to the other panelists, do you have any advice in regard to the job search process? Um, yeah, both uh, Veronica and Carrie just kind of mentioned, definitely your networks. Um, you know, a lot of the, the work I did with Bovid, like uh, we were at city council meetings all the time. We we're doing community forums, events. Um, always good to meet the folks at those events. Sometimes they're not always, um, you know, just community members, but also like people in those respective fields of policy, planning, EJ or other environmentalism jobs. Um, and that's honestly led me to like a, having a, uh, steady offers come in like after I graduated for a job um, where it, it kind of con like committing to that work and being very passionate, like really shown through of people reaching out um, for job offers or like, would you be interested in a role like this? So um, definitely that's been the biggest biggest thing. And two, I, I was very serious in my undergrad work, in my fellowships, in my internships. So each of those experiences um, contribute when, contributed when I entered the workforce outside of that. Because um, they, knew, they knew about like my background, my expertise. Um, and I was hired as a community engagement specialist with the city of Austin because they had already like reference my experience, my references, um, and I had, you know, documentation of the work I did, whether it was like research or whether it was like facilitation methods and stuff. So um, yeah, definitely the relationship piece is the biggest. Um, and having a mentor, uh, definitely, if, you know, in your classes, um, have a mentor to talk to. Um, I like the idea too of researching potential people in the jobs. If that sounds really interesting, research that. The podcasts you listen to about topics you really like, research their background. Um, there's, I still find really cool things that I'm interested in. And now I'm considering like, oh, if I were going back to school, what would I do for what you know, type of career path I'd want down the line? I think, I think relationships are key. I think that y'all are absolutely right. I mean, <clears throat> I, I definitely think back on my days um, being an undergrad, and I think I was probably intimidated by a lot of people that were like considered experts in the field that I wanted to get into. And I was like scared to like talk to them or reach out to them. And like now I think probably in hindsight, like why, why would it matter? Like reach out, like send them a message on LinkedIn or like send them an email, reach out to them. And the worst that's gonna happen is that they're like not gonna respond or they're gonna say no. Um, I think that I learned probably some of that skill like through doing door-to-door -door canvassing as like an environmental advocate and like having so many people like shut doors in your face and like having to keep like going out there and ask and ask and ask until you finally get a yes, um, probably like ingrain that. But like, if you can learn that without, um, having to go trial by fire, not to say that there's anything, you should you should come work for our organization and knock on doors, you should still do that uh, if you wanna do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say just in addition to that, like in this job market, I mean, 
I think about like the housing market that's right now, right? And they call it like a seller's market, right? Because it's like, if you have a house, like it's it's time to sell and you're going to win if you sell because the buyers are having to compete like seriously for it. Well, in the job market for like the first time in a long time, it's a worker's market right now. And you should leverage that as a worker. It is not like, it is not an employer's market right now to sell their jobs to you. It is a worker's market for workers to attain what they can get through their employment. Um, I might be getting some like side eyes. I don't know if like, if uh, there is any professors on the call who might get upset about this, but like unpaid internships are out y'all. <laughs> we should pay people for their work. We should pay people for their labor. Um, we should absolutely do that. And if you're looking for an internship, go for one that pays. I mean, really it's your work it's your time it's your labor you're selling that and like i know that like that maybe seems super transactional and weird um but like there are things that you're going to benefit from that job and you've got to live and you've got to pay rent and that's like your reality and that's my reality too and so um i think like go entering into this job market there's like really an ability i think for workers to negotiate things like stronger work-life balances i know that in the, the non-profit field in particular we've been guilty of this for many years where we talk about like well you got to make sacrifices for the movement for you know doing the right thing and like yeah i mean that's that's totally fair like we aren't going to pay a competitive salary with like these fortune 100 companies out there but the reality is is that like we could all do better to support our uh you know our workers and we can you know make this like we can, we can give everybody a livable wage. We can give everybody the benefits that they need, that we can give them time off. We can give them um, parental leave and, and all of the things that people are asking for are like totally reasonable demands and you should be demanding them. Awesome, thank you so much, Corey. I'm gonna move on to the um, student question portion of the panel. Um, feel free to keep adding questions to the chat and I'm just gonna go in order. Um, Professor Salinas Davis, since you didn't get a chance to do that one, could you be the first one to answer, how did your career surprise you in, um, in ways that it differed from your expectations? Yeah, right. Um, like I said in my intro, I did not, I never saw myself, it's very surprising to me, you know, um, that I would uh, have, um, Working, be working in, on the environmental sustainability side and never plan is total evolution. Um, and then even on the communication side, even though I, that was what I got my degree in, I never in my wildest dreams could have imagined I would be co-founding and running uh, and advertising and PR firm for more than two decades. So I think being nimble and jumping at the opportunities and, um, and having a certain passion too. So uh, if I would add to that last question about finding a job, find an employer, um, whether it's TCE or a large corporation uh, or somewhere in between that matches your passion and, and interests. And the other thing I would say too, is absolutely keep up with environmental news. The headline of today is what? IPCC third report. That was major environmental headline today. But I myself was in a meeting this morning and uh, or this afternoon, and I was sure glad I was up on the local issue of what's going on with our airport expansion and new fuel storage getting too close to a South uh, East Austin neighborhood. So that's my advice there. But as far as this question though, gravitate to your passion and take advantage of the opportunities, follow your energy. Veronica, would you also respond to that question? Let me know if you want me to repeat it. I, I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, my career was as expected because I did an internship at, while at Rice in the Office of Sustainability. So I already kind of got insight on to what to expect when starting my position. Uh, so no. Was no there surprises. anything that like you were pleasantly surprised into moving into an administrative role where you were directly managing students? No, um, okay. students are great to work with. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't have any fun. That's totally fine. Sorry. Darcy, do you want to ask the next question? 
Yeah, I can ask the next question. Um, it is from Jeanette. Um, they asked, did you have a general idea of what you would do in a sustainability slash environmentalism or in sustainability slash environmentalism from the beginning? Or did you just happen to fall into your current um, kind of area as you just kind of went with the flow? Um, Professor King, do you want to respond to that one? Uh, yeah, I can answer something. So. I, when I, I graduated my PhD in 20, 2004, and then I went, worked for a startup company that was trying to make a new kind of flat panel display, so kind of pure engineering science uh, product development stuff. But at the time, I kind of already had the thought that I wanted to work in energy, but I just I decided too late in my PhD, so I, I, I didn't have time to change my dissertation topic. And things were changing a lot in Texas, say, with you know wind power coming on and electric market changing and this kind of thing. So, so I actually quit my, I quit in 2006. I said, all right, I'm, I'm here, I've been here long enough. I don't know if this thing's gonna work out. And if I don't get, try to change and get into some kind of energy systems research then I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be gone too long or it's gonna be too hard. So, so I preemptively quit and then just kind of went to networking events in Austin and, uh, you know, found someone at UT, a new professor, and he was looking for people to come in. So I went in as a postdoc, and I've been here ever since. So, uh, so I'd say I, I didn't necessarily just go along with the flow. I had to kind of seek it out to do what I was wanting to do, which was more research oriented. Um, but uh, in some sense, I was lucky or opportunistic, I guess, to get back in. I'll say one more thing that didn't so I'm not a faculty member and I've applied to very few faculty jobs. Um, and I, I, I didn't, I got an interview for some, but didn't get accepted. But the one thing on the, on the other question, anything that surprised me about how the university operates, well, I was at UT so already, so it, as a student, so it didn't surprise me too much what I see. But one thing that's kind of surprising is, is sort of how much money it takes to get a faculty member to uh, engage in a research project. They just got, various things going on and limited time and you know like a one-year project is really hard to get faculty engaged in and if it's kind of be multidisciplinary where they have to learn about somebody else's terminology and ways of doing things then one year is really a short time and that tends not to work in some sense you have to engage them for, have funding or some way to engage them or a student who's really committed for at least two years to really get them to sort of think outside of what they normally do and it's not because they're not interested it's just because not always it's just because it's it takes so much of a time commitment compared to their other commitments that uh, it's just in some sense not possible so that's one one kind of thing i learned that's that's part of the difficulty of multidisciplinary research on a campus i'll stop there great thank you um adriana asked how does sustainability environmentalism um and environmentalism play into social justice slash equity in your respective fields celine maybe you could uh, answer that one and talk more about the work of EcoRise and how they incorporate those principles. Yeah, so EcoRise focuses on K through 12 environmental education for teacher professional development and student action. So um, I've been with them for almost a year now after working for the city of Austin's Office of Sustainability, but um, just integrating. Um, uh, equity lens into the curriculum that we develop that teachers utilize in the classroom. Um, they just created an environmental justice based curriculum to be embedded um, and all the curriculum is standards aligned um, across different school districts. But primarily for my role, I, I do a lot of research um, and data collection for our Gen Thrive effort, uh, which is like looking at GIS data, publicly available data. How can we use this in the classroom? How can this inform um, outside youth-centered projects that we're doing? Because for our youth councils, we use a framework called Youth Participatory Action Research. Um, and we have that in Austin and San Antonio this year. But just integrating a lot of that into our teaching methods and the facilitation that we do um, and also trying to improve green career ac uh, access and improving pathways. But, you know, I pull a lot of the lessons that I, again, my time with Poded has been really foundational 
that was built on even more with my work at the city of Austin and really trying to also integrate, you know, a lot of those um, different models of education, such as like popular education um, is used widely in social justice, anti-racist um, organizing spaces. And we utilize popular education models in our youth programming that we do outside of the classroom. So um, just thinking of the role of educators um, and our, you know, relationships with youth, um, thinking about also ethical research practices that is youth led, youth centered, um, community centered as well. And it, it's really interesting because I never thought that I, oh, like I want to be an educator. Um, that's, it's really changed my mindset about a lot of things. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot from teachers and the campus K through 12 space. So th there's just so much. And, you know, all the issues we talked about, you know, in college with Poder, with the city around affordability, climate change, um, flooding but, issues, you know, response to extreme weather events like the winter storm, all of those issues uh, always went back to the schools, to the Austin Independent School District. Um, because schools are community center hubs. That's where teachers are. That's where students are. That's where their networks with their parents and extended families come. So it's a really important um, space, both for climate education and climate action. Um, so yeah, it's, it's continuing to build upon my education around you know, climate, sustainability, environmentalism. Um, Corey, I don't know if you want to add to that too, if you would. I'll make one comment. I might ask, <laughs> see if Valerie had anything to say. I, I mean, I we meet with energy companies and these kinds of uh, people on, on campus all the time thinking about research. And it's it's not very many conversations or at least there are public forums. We'll have, I run a, a speaker series, a weekly speaker series, and next week will be uh, next Tuesday, not tomorrow, but will be one on. Uh, so, what are what are investors asking for oil and gas companies in terms of ESG type incentives? And that one will probably be pretty oriented towards, you know, the the business there, the, their business models. But you know, these companies are coming in and saying, yes, we've got people asking us about uh, environmental justice or different kinds of uh, metrics of accountability that they haven't used before and there is a big question and i'm this is not really my expertise um you know i think valerie mentioned you know advertising that's not greenwashing there's all these questions about whether this is this, the same kind of thing it just has a different nomenclature or not and there's so you know i guess that that's an area that you know, maybe could use some 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 clarity i don't know how much work <laughs> there is there's probably a lot of work to be done there but um it's just something i i don't know the answer to and uh I'm going to poke at Valerie and see if she has any thoughts on that. <laughs> Learn from her. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Um, or Carrie, there's Carrie yeah. in court. So Carrie. Yes. <laughs> um, anyway, I think that's such a great point and so timely this, um, you know, uh, that whole lens, you know, um, of Celine talked about the lens of environmental justice and, and big corporations, and in this case, fossil fuel companies, having to put the, the whole lens across it of environment, uh, social issues, and governance, and uh, government relations, community relations. And so I just had as a guest speaker to one of my classes last week, someone who uh, spent her, she's a UT grad, she spent her career working in tech communications, and she really gravitated uh, throughout her career into that, uh, that whole area of, you know, social impact side of, of corporate governance and became an expert at it. And that's where her passion was. And so she's just, um, uh, she quit her great job at Silicon Labs here in Austin and started a company called uh, IGC and Good Company. And she's developed a, a, a platform that gets, you know, uh, her clients subscribe to it and they get to have conversations about all these social impact 
uh, issues, whether it's sustainability, um, you know, um, diversity issues, all of that on the corporate social responsibility uh, area. And so she, she evolved into it and started a business on this whole area. Yes, pay attention to these new kinds of corporate expectations. I'll say one more thing unless other people don't have it. Um, so earlier, I, I think, uh, I think it was Corey who mentioned, you know, we had, you know, choose your employer, right? You interview your employer, you, you have some bargaining power there uh, at this time. And I, I think that's interesting. I'll just, um, there was a speaker from Chevron, chief science officer or chief sustainability officer was his title. He was a speaker about a month ago on campus. And he said something with the lines of our investors, which, you know, their shareholders, you know, sort of don't want them to change too much as a company. And so they sort of follow that and say, well, we're not going to change too much as a company. We're going to focus on, you know, uh, environmental uh, climate change related things that they could be good at, like, you know, carbon sequestration, carbon capture, building infrastructure. So as chemical engineering and, and, and geology, geology uh, engineering kind of ideas, as opposed to say, you know, studying electric cars or, uh, building renewable power plants. Uh, Shell is another large company and they kind of have the opposite approach. They're trying to become an electricity company. So each company is not the same. You could ask them these kinds of high level strategic questions, but there's also this question of, yeah, who, who is the, the management accountable to? Is it only shareholders or is it also the employees? You know, if they can't get the employees, then they're gonna lose capability as a company. So I think there's some some trade-off. I was, I was also at a, uh, this was a few years ago at a, Exxon has a lot of relationships with UT Austin. Anyway, there was a day there where it was kind of like UT and Exxon uh, love each other day. And the people in the audience got to talk to the president of UT and, and, a, and a high level executive at a working session. And they and some a lot of the questions from the Exxon employees were they can give money back to UT and they have matching programs. So they do this a lot. But it was they were asking questions like, how can I give money specifically for a certain type of student or for a specific type of research? And it would not be what you would think. Maybe someone would ask and they were asking essentially, you know, renewables. How do I only give a scholarship for renewables? How do I only do this? So the employees, you know, might think something different than the, what the company is doing. And um, I'm not an expert on how that can kind of build up within a company. And there's obviously challenges, but uh, something to keep in mind. And maybe you could ask companies when you, when you interview them how they view this trade-off. If they're a large company, but smaller, it may not be as applicable. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, if you guys have any very short last minute remarks, we're kind of at time. So if there's anything that you would like to say to um, the students here, or faculty and staff, if not, that's okay, no pressure, but totally up to you. Um. Go oh, ahead. Go, no, go, okay. I'm going to just go because I'm already talking. But um, try not to have so much anxiety comparing yourself to other people. I remember comparing myself to people whose parents were like environmental lawyers or were biologists. And I was like, oh, my parents could not help me with my homework growing up. Like, I, I don't know what I want to do. Um, so, you know, the, the time you have in college before entering the work workforce is your time to explore is your time to figure out what you are passionate about and what you want to learn. Um, and you're going to be learning from others, learn from your peers, learn, you know, there's a lot of interesting work that happens um, on a campus or university space. I, I feel like, honestly, I was really radicalized when I was at the university because it's such a sphere of learning from your faculty, from your uh, peers that have, like do research and do, you know, community action. So, um, that's part of it, all of your education. That's all part of the education experience, higher education experience you're having. Um, and, you, you know, just, just trust the process and don't worry about having to check off every single thing that we mentioned here that you should be doing. Um, everyone has a unique path. Everyone, you know, your passions and your work kind of lead you, you know, to your, your spot. So good luck. I'll be really quick. I was just going to say, appreciate the impact that you do have. Um, it's very easy when you're in a sustainability career to feel like you're not doing enough or there's challenges are just so broad and you as an individual person can't address them all. It's important to just take a step back and 
just appreciate what you have done and the impact that you have, big or small, um, and know that you are doing something in the grand scheme of things. It, I, I'd love to add on real quick too, basically an ad for my environmental communications class. So for you uh, students at UT Austin, um, it's interdisciplinary. We're in the Moody College of Communication, Advertising and PR School. Samara's Sustainability study, Studies and is in Liberal Arts. About half my students, even though it's ad and PR class, are from sustainability studies, but I've had, you know, chemists, government majors, business majors uh, uh, participate. And so the course, even though it's new, it now counts as a credit to sustainability studies. And I'm in talks, it looks like it's going to count in the College of Communication, which is a whole minor you might consider. Uh, is science communications and, and having environmental communications, which we operate like an advertising and PR firm. So every student walks out with a comprehensive portfolio, but having environmental communications be that capstone course for science communications. So check it out. Thank you. I'll just mimic what Celine and uh, Veronica said that you know, I, I'm, I'm could probably be considered. You know, I don't know how successful I am. I mean, decent number of papers and and one book published. And uh, I think you know, it's it's sort of your internal uh, personality that makes you feel satisfied or not. Uh, you know, I could probably punish publish a hundred more papers and decide to feel unsatisfied if I wanted to. So I think it's uh, up to you to know you you think you're doing what you like and you're thinking you're doing quality work. Yeah, I can definitely echo a lot of what's been said. This is great. Um, this is a great time of your life to find yourself, to find out what you're interested in. Um, you know, your career might happen upon you or you might have to go track it down. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's important to know that, you know, a lot of people have this perspective of like, you should absolutely do what you love. And that could be your career or that could also be your life outside of a career. And that's something that you get to negotiate. And um, so, you know, think about what you do for your day job and think about who you want to become as a person. Um, and then as far as like, uh, you know, having an environmental impact, um, familiarize yourself with, you know, the organizations that are out there that are doing good work, you know, familiarize yourself with the concept of greenwashing, because there's like a lot of, you know, speak out there in the corporate world, like with the whole ESG movement and uh, shareholder spaces that like every corporation wants to be speaking to the values of the public. And just remember that corporations are generally after two things, it's profit and it's their own self-image. And really the self-image part only matters as much as it generates profit. And so if you're thinking about the things that motivate a corporation, um, you know, you can have that lens and think of how can I be critical about what I'm going, what I'm getting myself into. Um, and you can kind of identify like which of these corporations uh, or industries are really just trying to greenwash and which of them are maybe doing something that more aligns with my values. Uh, towards sustainability. So um, yeah, use a critical mind. That's uh, what I took away from my college experience and then just do a lot of experimentation with everything and, and get to know who you are. So I'm not hearing your audio. Mara, I think you're muted, but um, I'm gonna hop in real quick. We did create a um, like a document with career resources. I'm gonna put that in the chat right now for free to use that. Um, and then Samara, back to you. Can you hear me now or no? Okay. Yes, we can hear you now. Awesome, my mic decided to stop working. So I said thank you to all of our panelists for uh, sharing your experiences with us. Please check out that list of uh, career resources that we compiled. It's not an, you know, an end all be all list, but it might be helpful as you search for internships and um, potential job opportunities or graduate school plans. Um, additionally, um, I've been kind of chosen to close this uh, conference out from the student perspective, so I wanted to thank you all for attending and to thank um, all the speakers and faculty and students who were involved in making this virtual student summit a success. Um, the theme of today's conference is student empowerment and climate action, and I'm super proud to have been a part of planning a uh, conference that has been designed by and for sustainability student leaders across Texas. 
as our conference comes to a close, I wanna encourage you all to reflect on what you learned today, um, specifically about climate action, consider what made an impact on you and how you would like to incorporate that in your life, um, whether you pursue the project you developed through the uh, sustainability uh, sunrise movement guided workshop or apply the insight you learned from our keynote, our career panelists or sustainability um, organizations, you'll be taking some sort of action on climate change. Um, I'm gonna turn to Gary Koki, our TRAX um, executive committee member from the University of Texas at Dallas to close us out. Thank you, Samara. Um, and thank you for all of the participants. This has been amazing. Um, and I, I've enjoyed every, every piece of this event. Um, hopefully all of the attendees here found inspiration, uh, collaboration and agency over the issues that we're talking about. Um, behalf of the TRACS Executive Committee. I know to thank uh, Dr. Sarah Ray for the keynote, uh, Kevin Patterson with Sunrise Movement for the workshop, um, all of the career panelists that participated in the panel and all of the student presenters that were. And if I could invite all of the attendees to please join me and uh, thank the student organizers that really put this entire event together. Um, we had Anastasia Whittemore from UTD, Fitzpatrick from Rice, Darcy Hansen from Southwestern, Paige Worth from Texas A&M, and Samara Zuckerbrod from UT Austin. Um, they took the reins in putting together the vision, the panel, the flow of this entire event, and. Uh, anybody that has organized uh, a summit or, or done any community organizing knows that that is a, a monumental task. So please drop them a note in the chat. Let them know how much you appreciate the work to put this event together. Um, I know that I'm inspired. Uh, I know that I, I talk to students and sustainability issues are, are the challenges that this generation is going to face. Um, it's the application of the education that students are receiving uh, this event and you will um, find what you're called to do and hopefully this has been a tool to um, empower you to do that. You check what Veronica said and um, appreciate the impact that you have. Don't underestimate the voice that you have as a student. I know that on campuses um, we all work to provide what students wish to see. And so when you make your voices heard, universities will respond. And as you graduate, you're going to be the next generation of leaders. So um, it really keeps me heartened in what I do, to see uh, the types of conversations that we had today. Um, I believe that this generation is up to meet the challenges that, that you're going to face. Thank you all that attended. And um, I just want to say, please, Keep, a, keep an eye out for the second annual uh, Student Summit next year. Um, I believe that we've had such success with the leadership from the student planners this year. I, I'm fairly confident to say that we look forward to doing this again next year. Thank you all and have a great evening. <laughs>